face. Oh. Uh, hey, am I live? And I think I am, which is good news. Because I heard myself then, which is excellent. And okay, so that's probably the wrong thing. Let me show my desk there. Um, no, maybe not. Yes. So thanks for signing in. I'm going to um, start the start the session as I mean to go on with a uh, a bang from the gong, of course. Hopefully that won't like break your speakers or anything. I'm trying to be gentle with the gong. So it's me again, it's Robin and um, from the UK and hopefully the stream is working. Actually, I can see the stream. That looks good. I've got the chat up just in case one of my two fans turns up. That would be fantastic. Uh, please say something in the chat if you if you can see any problems because I've had problems with streaming last week. So I'm just going to write in the chat now myself and just say hello. So uh, check the audio out as well. Hey, I'm stuck in a dungeon. And um, just turn off some of these noises as well. That's a bit better. I could turn the bonfire back on. Maybe not. So what am I doing? I'm going to be doing what I do every week, which is pulling up uh, monsters and filling up dungeon rooms using the Dungeon Crawl Classics books. I'm still echoing a bit there, I think. And uh, the aim being that I'm writing an adventure at the moment, and the, um, as I fill out the adventure, I type it up and using the good Dungeon Crawl Classics books, I'm able to do that. And of course, the other thing is, although I'm writing this for Dungeon Crawl Classics and I'm creating monsters using stats in here, uh, these books themselves, the Monster Alphabet and the Dungeon Alphabet, uh, both you know completely system independent, they'll work with anything, um, you know, D&D, &D, anything you're doing, uh, those will work well for you because they don't have sort of stats and things in there. They have ideas and hints for how certain scenarios and things and monsters will work, uh, which may involve a certain amount of hits or damage or will saves and things, but they don't really, um, they're, not, they're generic, so they don't really focus on Dungeon Crawl Classics, although for my usages here, I am doing it with Dungeon Crawl Classics. And if I just uh, show the whole desktop there, so I can show these books in all their glory. I also have the Cthulhu alphabet, which is a recent uh, purchase in the last few weeks. And there were a few interesting things in there. There's these Vorish hand symbols, which are kind of obviously connected to Cthulhu and cultish type behavior. But I quite like the hand symbol type magic to be used in the setting that I'm putting together. And also... Um, uh, that was it. Although I did have the uh, annual as well, which I haven't used as much as I'd like. I probably need to dive into this more um, outside of this session, but it has some nice uh, gods and um, patrons, deities and things in there as well. And I'm going to create a deity in the setting that I'm putting together, so I have been thinking what might be worth um, sort of modelling it on something that's in there and then just stripping it down to what I want, because a deity is like a two or three page piece of work and I'm sort of um, keeping away from that at the moment. So I uh, use my Raspberry Pi desktop which I've just switched over to and I always like to just mention that I'm using a Raspberry Pi because it's a simple little um, uh, single board computer and I'm on the wrong thing to show it but I've got my overlays and there it is, Raspberry Pi. So basically your Raspberry is just like a little single board computer and uh, that's what I use on here. It's running a version of Linux and it runs a Chromium browser so I can use all of the Google Docs stuff live on here and type up my adventure as I'm doing it. So I'll get rid of that as well. And just to mention again, uh, obviously this is on the Goodman Games stream so just welcome any um, input if you do manage to come along. I can see that there's six little faces um, it's telling me on the stream screen, um, so please ask me questions and stuff as I get stuck in, or, or welcome anything really. So yeah, so the adventure is set, uh, we've called it a working title, Beneath the Valley of the Ultranoles, 
it's set in this place called Scarp Sea, although I haven't really, you know, it's not a whole realm or anything at the moment, it's just one uh, region that I put together. I sketched this out, so if you've not been following these streams that happen every week, if you go about, about nine episodes, there's a recorded one um, where I draw this out. It's the first thing I did, and in fact, that was the first way I started this, is I drew out the map, and then I started to fill it out with named items and various other things as I went. And in the middle of it, you've got the Oblix here, and this is the main dungeon, which is like a weird old strange temple that's a block of obsidian with an entranceway in the top uh, where there's a goddess dying in there. So all the good uh, usual Dungeon Crawl Classics stuff in that the characters are going to encounter gods and goddesses and get involved in sort of very dangerous activities is the idea. And uh, the last couple of weeks I was doing the Barrows over here. And I think I've done the barrows now, so I'm back really over to the Oblix, and probably I'm thinking maybe like within about two more episodes I'll have most of the whole adventure um, written down really, because um, it's only going to be short, um, and a couple of key locations, one being the uh, location I did with the barrows over the last few weeks, and the other being the main Oblix there. So... Um, what I'm trying to avoid to do is every week going through and telling everybody about the adventure over and over. So I'm just going to dive into where I was. And also I'm going to do some tidy up on my stat blocks, which will allow me to kind of review some of the monsters I've done before in the Oblix, in the two layers of the Oblix. By uh, doing some tidy up, I'll, at the same time I'll be able to um, explain those and get the document back into shape. So about halfway through things, I started to put together this newer looking I just turn off one of my stream screens there uh, this newer looking stat block and of course in the nice um, Dungeon Crawl Classics adventure modules they put everything in that nice little tight short stat block in that certain sequence that repeats in every book so you know where you are but for me while I was writing on the screen here it was much easier to have fields to fill in so all I've done is a table um, but essentially it's all the goodness of a, you know, a standard uh, government games stat block with initiative alignment armor class, hit dice, movement, and then the saves over here. So um, fortitude, reflex, and will. And of course, if you are if you are familiar with um, Dungeon Crawl Classics or not, uh, but you get an action dice for monsters. So if, basically, rather than saying something has two attacks, you just give it an extra action dice. And that might be 2d20, it might be 2d16, 2d24, whatever, or three or four. So the bigger and more powerful the monster is, the generally the more attacks it would might get, and therefore you would give it an extra action dice. And that's described in the Goodman Games way of just another d20 or another dice of a certain kind. Uh, so these were the first creatures that they, the players are potentially going to encounter, the huggers, but I'm just using that template, so I'm going to copy and paste this um, down. So I'm going to get all these books out of the way. So. And if you're a bit late to the stream, I'll just show my books off again. There you go. Monster Alphabet. I, I haven't got the special cover version of that, but, you know, thanks. Joe Bittman and Michael Curtis. Excellent book, that one. I understand Michael Curtis started these sort of books um, by creating lots of tables on a blog. And um, and then these glorious things were eventually, um, you know, brought together tables that he did into something you could use to create adventures. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so just get all that out of the way. I'll only be grabbing it again in a minute and then uh, do this. So of course, as I was saying before, I've got my Raspberry Pi and I can much more quickly bring that up, which I use as my desktop. And I've just got a separate like, little mouse that I use for that on there because um, it's a separate desktop and it's a little wireless mouse. These are great, by the way, these Logitech Pebbles, I think they're called, like low cost mouse, but they uh, work a treat for not taking up any room. Anyway, back to the Raspberry Pi. And now I can cut and paste my stat block and tidy up the stuff that's in the Oblix and talk through the Oblix while I'm there as well, just because I, it's about time I revisited the, uh, the dungeon of the Oblix and sorted that out. Um, so this was the um, uh, Barrow Mound anyway, so you can see that's going by. I've been doing that for the last two weeks, so I won't touch on that at the moment with all the creatures and stuff that's in there. Scrolling down. A bit of background about a dragon that's related to the adventure that I've put in there as well. Myra Meagles, who's like an old cultist from the forgotten, uh, for, a forgotten cult, which I've now forgotten because it's been two weeks. And there you go, the cult of the forgotten eye. 
has long been forgotten along with her. So she's been put in this room inside the barrow and left in stasis for a hundred years. So she's gone a bit crazy. And I use some um, some of the good parts in Cthulhu for the madness rolls on that. So I'm moving through. Uh, so this was the Ibis avatar. So I used the dungeon uh, monster book to create this by pulling together a multi-headed beast. It was like a lion's body, Ibis face. And I gave it like a sonic spear that it would scream out of its mouth that it could um, fire. And this one, as I mentioned higher up, there you go, I've just done that by mistake. Uh, this one I gave a 2D, 2D20 action dice. So let me move down a bit quicker because I've just gone a bit funny there. There we go, Ibis Avatar. Just mention that again. Oh, there's the rugs. Hmm. If I, pay, if I do a, a carriage return there, we'll get it onto one page and be able to read it back. So just explain the Ibis avatar. So yes, I gave it two D20 action dice so it could do two attacks. Um, and I was probably going to say it could do one Sonic Spear per, per, per round. So I might actually just put that in its special. So Sonic Spear, well, I've already said it, once per round the Ibis avatar will scream with a thunderous howl, releasing a spear of sound. This visible wave piercing sound can target out to six foot and the Ibis able to see uh, both sea and fire its screeching spear sound through walls of up to thickness of five foot I've said. So the idea is that with this um, avatar it's guiding a guarding a final room in there a worship room and it's a large room with dry clack, cracked flagstones with a race century with a 10 foot tall dragon statue with mottled black and grey granite. Um, oh hi there Virat Raj Lani, thanks for saying hello. Um, I've got my uh, the other thing this week. I've got the chat up. I put the chat on a separate screen out of the way last week, and I had someone come in and say, oh, "Hello, I want to get involved," and then I didn't see it, and they they went away. <laughs> so I'm not very good at the whole audience retention, but uh, I'll, if anybody does say anything, I can answer it. So that was the Ibis avatar. It's wrapped around a dragon statue. It's got its foot on uh, the dragon's lower jaw because I rolled in um, Michael Curtis's book and it said that the statue had something missing that then generated something else like um, a, a key event. So I've said that the Ibis is high, is trying to stop the dragon's draw from being put back onto the uh, statue. If they defeat the Ibis uh, creature, they will potentially be able to reunite the dragon's draw with the dragon's statue, which um, uh, is going to alert the presence of Idina the God to the local <laughs> resident dragon that's up in the mountains. So uh, that's something they may want to do, but also may not as well depending on how things go. Right, so scooch down then really to the Oblex. So this is the big uh, main dungeon and, and I'll just bring up my screen to show that on the desk there. So here it is, there's the Oblex in the middle. I've only done, I do tell two floors in it. I may put a third, like a basement floor in there, but I've done two floors so far. And that's the main location of the uh, adventure in that the goddess in there, I don't know, is dying. She's slowly fading. She's been in there 900 years plus, um, but she's not got any followers anymore and she's fading away. And there's, a, there's a, a creature on the second floor down that's kind of half the cause of that um, in that her old followers have forgotten their ways and are no longer worshipping her. But they are, the followers of hers are in there as well. And they're the Ultranulls, which, uh, which is the namesake of the adventure beneath the Valley of the Ultranulls. Yes, so let's get in there. So the first floor of the Oblex, um, it has uh, steps down from the roof. So it's a big black square Oblex thing, 100, 130 foot or more foot taller than that. I can't remember which I wrote. But when they climb down from the roof, they're into this room seven. Um, oh no, that isn't the right map. <laughs> Let me find the right dungeon map. There's the Oblex room, first floor. So yes, as they approach the Oblex, the first thing they do if they land on the top, however they're going to get onto the top, is these gold bats. And there we go, I can see they've got the old stat block which I need to tidy up so I can talk through those as I tidy up the, 
the gold mats. So there's my huggers stat block, and all I'm going to do is just migrate over uh, the stats for the gold bat, which are like a leathery gull thing, uh, which again I used a cave cricket from the DCC main book to detail that out. So I can see initiative is plus two, alignment chaotic, AC is 14, so they're a little bit more agile, even though they're kind of small bird-like things. And I've got hit dice as 2d8, so I gave them quite a lot of hit dice actually. So they're not that small. And I gave them a fly. I gave them move 10 foot slash um, 10 foot if they're on the floor because they're not that fast. Just stretch that out to make it fit in. And then attack is a claw. And the, or the other thing that I've done is I, I've now been taking out the special kind of background thing. I don't know why I put it in the big old uh, chart before, in the table before, but it's a bit of a mess putting it in there. So I've taken that out. So I'll just cut that out of there and hope that it doesn't try and drop a table in for me at the same time when I paste it in here. It has. I don't want it in a table. Just get rid of that fun with copy and paste. That's how I want it to select, not the entire table. That'll do it. I think I've got a wind situation blowing my door. I feel like I'm on a ship or something at the moment. I'm going to go and shut that door. But that's it, it's in there. Just shut the door. I'm back. Right, so that's copied in the description. The black leathery wing gull sized bird, rather than a normal feathered wings, the gull bats have stretched dark skin over bony tipped wings that the feature they feature a striking red beak. So I've done the move, I've done the hit dice. I haven't done the action the dice, but I've only given them one. So yeah, they've only got the one action dice and fortitude is one. Reflex is going to be quite good because they're agile two and will. And will I had three? A minus three? How did I get that out? I think I gave them, probably because I just copied the stats from the book. So I'm going to give them that and I'm going to give them two in reflex because they are fast moving bird things and will save, I'm not going to give them anything, so that's fine. And the attack is claw. Why did I write claw plus one and then bite 1d3? It doesn't help much, does it? Get rid of that old stat block now that we've got back to the gold bats. Good. So basically with the dive bomb I used it a bit like the cave crickets have this kind of combined action that they can do when they attack. So you roll in 1d20 to determine the number of gold bats that join the fight. Add 1d4 per gold bat and compare that to the total roll, uh, total roll to the stamina of characters within 100 foot. If the total is higher than a player's stamina as they may they take the difference in damage. So basically they're just struck by this guano strike that comes down uh, while they're on the top of the Oblix trying to find their way in. And that's giving me the wrong font there. So I don't know if I can, just trying to keep things tidy, keep the font the same as well. So that's that done, that's that sort of tidied up a little bit with the gold bats on there. And then moving through to the other monsters and we can talk through the rooms as we go. So the Oblex to start with there on its level one. So of course it has a flat roof on top of this uh, whole section. And uh, when they come into room one, it's like a, a, a large corridor kind of entrance hall area. 
and then there's a flooded room here with a, a giant crab in so that's probably the first thing I'll do is they explore if they go that way they'll they'll meet the giant crab which I have detailed under the water so that room is um, now that is interesting because I've started to do the rooms having a description with the read aloud text in italics but I haven't done that for the giant crab below the surface because I just started out when I was doing that I haven't got that sorted so I'll do it stat block first so we can talk about the giant crab as I put it together oh, I didn't change that there either And basically, I can now copy that up. So I've given it an initiative two, uh, action die one, AC 18, because it's got such a hard carapace. And the dice, hit dice is 2d8 plus two. Reflex zero and will zero. So basically, it's a reasonably swift little crab, but we haven't given it any, any reflex. So it's. I might put its reef fortitude up because it's such a heavy, heavy monster. Um, I'll just do that because I feel like it. And its attack, it's got claws plus five. And they're gonna do a bit more than the usual damage. What's that stretching off there? 2d6 plus two per claw. And I think yeah, it's not going to have the guano strike either. Obviously, that's the gold bat. Seems a shame, since I was sort of aiming this at level 3 to 4-ish, seems a shame not to give it two action dice, given that it has two claws, but I don't. I'm going to give it two action dice, so it's got two attacks, and then worry about if that doesn't work later on as in it's maybe too powerful we'll see what happens when I start playtesting and put my uh, party through there that's everything else done so that's tidied up that mess of a stat block there whoa there you go that's the problem you get sometimes with uh, google docs I just thought I was going to select a table I end up selecting the entire document so get that down there Delete it and then get rid of the table altogether. So, monsters, a giant cloud is murky waters. So, I'm going to go back up because, as I said, what I haven't done is I've written an intro for the main entrance hall area, but I didn't then write, write an intro for you know a read aloud block essentially for the next room because back when I was doing this I was just sort of rushing through so now I've got a sort of a template I know that I want to do it in a specific way to sort of match how they do it in the Goodman Games books just to make sure I'm, I'm doing the right thing so room 1a I'll just call it the pool room And then get rid of that thing about a giant crab under the surface because really this is the bit that the uh, judge needs to read to the players uh, before you get onto that. And then the only other thing is that entrance way hall, which is now half over one page and another page. Bring that back up a bit. That hasn't even got any text underneath it so let's start there it's a clear it, it is clear that the entire structure is cut from the same as as the outer walls the oblates when when they reach the bottom of the spur of the carved steps they enter an entrance hall carved and weather worn i was going to say whoops steps in the wrong place now You enter an entrance hall. It's empty. This is empty, although it's lined with niches, each holding the bus. No, it's not empty then, is it? So this cool damp room is lined. 
with nieces, each holding the bust of a long forgotten individual. I'm going to call that subject. There are six in total in each, and then I'll just say, other than, oh, so, so now I need to detail the exits on there. I'll just go back up. So there it is. There is an exit in the north and the south. Exit to the north. Both are wooden doors. Just on a hello, you here, so pardon any fire. Yeah, what is an oblex? It's a very large uh, building. Thanks for asking, Just Honor. Um, if I bring up the desktop, it's just a word I made up to um, describe a very big dungeon type temple that's been transported here from uh, during a wizard battle over nearly a thousand years ago. And it ended up in the middle of this. Um, ravine and with no really easy way to get in but these local villages originally when it arrived started to worship it over a thousand years ago but time has now passed by and there's no no further worship going on which means there's a goddess in there that uh, who had been torn from her own sort of um, realm and she's no longer got any followers so she's fading away she has maybe like a few weeks left to live until the party encounter her and get in there and, and get into all sorts of trouble so uh, it's large dungeon type thing and they're and I'm detailing the floors of that at the moment as I'm just tidying up so there you go and um, I'll switch back to my desktop yes yeah, so the oblex entrance hall back on there so as you're saying there's the map and I picked this map that's a nice a nice square shape so that represents the top floor and that oblex that I just pointed out on the map in fact I think I can overlay it so where is it? There it is. So right in the middle there is the oblix. It has a tiny little entrance with uh, steps down where they first encounter these gull bats, which I just uh, fixed the stat block on. They've now walked down that stairway on the top, on the center of that map there. And this is where they uh, find themselves in room one. And I'm just tidying things up now because previously, as I said, I, I wasn't actually properly writing things in a way of saying that there's the read aloud text and then there's the sort of um, judge text behind it. So both wooden doors feature some, um, some carvings which look to be related to a scene. with various sigils and inscriptions below. These are arcane in nature and a wizard can attempt Um, intelligence to determine which are twin suns, I'm going to say, and stars that are not naturally occurring in this region. So basically they get a view for, hang on a minute, this does feel like a bit of an alien object in there. Um, the doors are locked, I'll just say the doors are unlocked. And I hadn't put any traps or anything on there. Uh, it's just a normal entrance hall. So then if they go to the north, they end up in the pool room. So again, I need to do the read aloud block for that. Oh, thanks, Justana. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, just uh, just to whiz back to the top, Justana, I'm on page 15. Th there's the name of the adventure. It's beneath the Valley of the Ultra Niles. And the idea is that this goddess had some worshippers before she was flung into this realm. 
and uh, they're still residing on, a, on the next dungeon level down, um, but they've stopped worshipping her, so she's fading away. And when the players first encounter her, Idenea, the goddess, she they all discover that she's only like a set of vascular system and a brain on a stem because there's very little of her left before she fades out. So back to page 15. Down here, and we have the entrance hall. That's done. So now read aloud block for the pool room. Just say something like 80 foot square. Which has a large. I can actually pull that up as well, make that italic so that it's all on the part of the same thing, because I'd kind of written it as if it was a read aloud for the players before. So this 80 foot square pool room features a large central. Dias in, I've already said it's central dais with I'm not going to say large, I'm just going to say seven foot tall. Statue of a bullhorn man featuring a current tail. The silver is tarnished, but clearly, of some pressure notes, the statue appears to be pointing down its feet where a plaque can be seen on the floor. Now, what we said about the inscription, which I shall bring it back up to here. So the inscription on this room, when we rolled it up in the dungeon book, So put it here so it's more relevant having what the inscriptions are. So a set of writings at the foot of the Silver Devil statue and can be memorised phonetically despite it being a different language. So this is actually uh, something that needs to be read out to get to the next floor. Um, so whether they want to memorise that or not is up to them, but it will make it easier to get onto the next floor. So if memorised, um, the can be spoken to the door and then I'll just remind myself of the room and the door's name because I actually created a door that was an intelligence door to get down to the next level. I need to fix all those stat blocks there which I've messed up. Some random text got into there. That's probably deleted my map potentially. Yes, yeah, so I said this room was a grand entrance hall to this floor of the temple. There's various drapes painted in the wooden panels. The only ob obvious exit in the door in the north is made of the same rusting iron. Um, yeah, I'm going to release it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Either just stick it uh, as a free download, or I might get a printed, uh, might do like a print on demand type thing. But uh, um, so then the door is stuck. The door is a stuck up privileged old priest of the temple called Dijax, and since his death, he's been bound into the door to first check for the rites of passage. So the rusting iron mounted statue in here will attack and animate. If I say, if one of the characters speaks the phonetic. Phonetically memorized phrase from the base of the silver statue in the pool room, the door my jacks will allow the group through. So yes, essentially that room is the entrance way to the second dungeon. I had to jump down there because this is a small room. I had to jump there because I thought if I've just if they're reading that inscriptions to be able to get their way down to the next level, I'll just write it on there that it's available. 
lots of other stuff there. It needs tidying up the busted stat block there. And we're nearly done on this room. Where are we? There's the giant crab. Okay, so the silver is tarnished, but clear of some pressure of the statue. It's a big point down its feet where a plaque can be seen on the surface. Set a right in the foot of the stone devil. And in the tarnished silver. Can be memorized. Despite being a different language to the reader, if Margaret had spoken at the, to the door named Ijax, whoops, in the entrance hall to level two. So yes, that was again, thanks again to Michael Curtis's book because I rolled on a table that said that there'll be something there that can be memorized phonetically but not read. I quite like that. It's like an interesting quirk that if they read it, they can actually say it, but they don't know what it means. And then I had Monster. And it's one giant, a giant crab in the murky one is hungry and will attempt to hide in shallows. So I changed the uh, hide in shadows to hide in shallows. So I've said there's a 75% chance it will remain hidden uh, and its first attack will be like a surprise by a nasty claw up on the leg. Um, and then I've said special can hide in shallows 75% of the time. If the crab is hidden, and the party don't make attempts to, to search for anything in the water. Murky water. Oh, I've said it will auto crit on its first strike because it's going to get an absolutely perfect attack on a leg. So I think actually I gave it two action dice. I'm going to give it one because um, I think it's quite powerful if it so it doesn't make attempts to search for anything in the murky water. It will take its first hidden strike, typically against a character's legs, so that's going to be a bit nasty. Um, and that isn't that hit points isn't right, so I need to remind myself to put the hit points in, which I think I'm just going to say that it's got 13, maybe 14, because it's a plus two. I would work out that specifically, but I'm not going to bother. I'll just stick 14 straight in. So then I've said also the entire structure will retract into the floor, protecting the silver, protecting it. Um, and so I'm looking at something I've written before, so I'm doing some basic editing while I'm at it here. And the track will trigger if anyone, if any one, if a character. Attempts to pull, yank, or cut any part of the silver. Or cut any part of the silver. Statue. Get rid of all that. I'll just say, I don't need to say very suddenly, I'll just say a large block will fall onto the full stone plinth whilst the character the statue will sink rapidly below the surface of the water, leaving anyone behind to face the crushing light of a massive block of receiving from above. Okay, so that's like a nasty trap anyway. That's it, done. So there's a nasty crab in there that's going to try to hide in shallows uh, if they try and forge their way over to the statue. So that's probably just worth saying as well. So the plinth is a stone platform with sat on the pool of water that looks deep, four to six foot. And I'll just use the word murky in there again, just to make it difficult to see things. Characters will have to forge away. Statue. 
And then the only thing about the inscription I said, if the statue track is triggered, the inscribed left, uh, side phrase is left behind. along so that's just to say that they may trigger the issue but may trigger the trap but they can still get to read that piece of text just so it's not too harsh that um, the actual text is hidden completely after the destruction although again that's up to the judge they could say that it's all crushed underneath there so this is room two. So this was to the south of the dungeon um, entrance hall. So room two here. And this has, um, it's like an armory, plus it's got a metal grilled floor with a flaming location in the middle, which I'll just describe. And again, I need to do the whole um, read aloud conversion on here because I didn't give it a read aloud, although I just attempt to do that by putting that in italics and just see what happens. Uh, this room has a blackened metal grill for a floor with occasional bursts of flame that flare up from beneath the grill. It's otherwise filled with a selection of weapons lined up on, on a metal frame at the south of the room. The weapons include a bronze spear, a hand axe, a shield, and two throwing daggers. They are all ancient, however, the bronze materials used to make them have prevented corrosion. They like to run after four weeks of use and require repair. I won't need to write that. So that is not read aloud. Basically, just to separate that, I can just bring that down a line or two and just get the weapons are all ancient. So if they start to use them, they'll start to blunt. Maybe they won't know the properties of bronze or something. So why not stick that on there anyway? Um, and then also I, what I didn't mention in the center, and I'll just finish the read aloud and say in the center is a four foot tall, five foot tall, metal, Framed construction. No, what can I say? No, metal framed stand is probably the best way to put it. Uh, with a wire mesh on the top. The flames constantly lit around this metal. Making a small nest nearly red hot. A medium sized, I'll just say a large egg. I'm going to call it a black egg. On top of the frame. There you go. So, in the center of the room, so now this is the judge bit. In the center of the room uh, is a furnished like contraption with a wire nest on top of it. The flames from the floor are sucked up towards this red hot furnace, red hot nest of wire. And on top of the confused wire mesh is a black egg wreathed in flame. The egg has a companion dragon to be hatched for identity of the goddess. Uh, before she was held captive without the objects. She wasn't held captive, so I've just because I've changed that as I've worked on, so I've said, I know the goddess, uh, before she was thrown before the temple was thrown into this realm. The dragon is now stillborn after centuries, I'll just say.
Uh, since she's over egg, the dragon I think is now stillborn and undead within the egg and may attempt to latch onto players as a parent if the egg is held and cracks open. If players attempt to cross the room, they are required to make a stamina agility. Stamina? Just an agility check will do. Agility check of DC 15 to avoid the flames. One roll is required to retrieve the egg and one roll is required per weapon to reach the rack and return to the safety of the door. Yeah, so basically the weapons are going to be spread out so they can make a dash over, try and avoid the flames as they lick up from the, the metalwork below and they can also try and attempt to get the egg if they like. Probably should. I don't want to detail it too much, but I could do like a hot potato situation with the egg because it is kind of very hot on the top there. What I haven't done either is detailed the stats of the the, the small unborn dragon because when that pops out, um, it'll try and bond to someone in the party. And I, what I want to do is make that quite interesting and quirky, but I haven't sorted that out yet so that's something to do so that's room two and then I'll, I'll, I know there's some other rooms where I need another stack block now to start tidying up the other rooms so I'll just copy this giant crab I'm going to reuse that and then just come up again and remind myself of the actually yeah remind myself of the dungeon there so basically there's these two rooms up here room six and room five uh, which both have keys in them and I shall dig that out. Corridors there. Okay, so again, room six, what I haven't done is a read aloud, but I've also got some undead in there. So let's get those dealt with and let's sort out this room in terms of um, giving it a proper read aloud in that room as well. It's me. That seems like a decent enough read aloud. A large dusty meeting room with four skeletal figures sitting at a large stone table in the centre of the room. Some food remains can be seen scattered along with dusty plates. And utensils. I'll just say and knives. So here we go. When entering the room, the party's torches are drawn toward the centre of the table as if by some invisible thread. Uh, they can, or, and or magic, I'm just saying. They can notice this through experimentation or by an intelligence check of DC 10. So basically, um, all of their torches are drawn towards that table. If the table is approached, the four skeletal figures will raise, rise and fight to defend the room, attempting to force the party back out to the corridor. They won't follow anyone out of the room except to defend themselves and then return to their ancient dinner. So here's with their stats and I called them jade bones um, and I sort of based them on a skeleton so let's just put that in the top there, jade bones. I will write skeleton underneath as a kind of undead skeleton or just I could give it a class of that's undead but I call it skeleton. Tell you what, that's a that's a nasty little feature of Google uh, Google Docs. When you start to type, it, if and if you're inside a um, a table, it uh, it hides the text. So you go to yourself, what have I just done? I don't know. for spell check. So J Bones is skeleton. Initiative I've got down at zero. Alignment chaotic. AC I've got down as nine, so very basic AC. And hit dice I've got 1d6. So again, they're uh, easy to bring down these, but they have an interesting feature that I wrote up and their move is just 30 foot. Now that reminds me, I probably didn't change the move on the crab. And one action die. So they've got clawed hands, which they can attack with, which is 1d3. And that's a simple plus a zero because they are a basic skeleton. Uh, 
and one action dice. So fortitude, let's get that down in there, plus zero, reflex zero, will plus zero actually. So they're again, skeletons don't have much going for them in terms of their basic saves. And So this is where I'll pull out the special description because this is where they have some dozens of small jade fire beetles inside the inside their chest cavity, which is the thing that makes them a little bit more powerful and interesting. And soon have this tidied up. Right, so I don't know what's writing in there. Impossible to read. Let me get rid of it and then I'll uh, bring it. Oh, actually, there you go. 1d6, 30 foot. So that's the Jade Fire Beetles, basically. So. So a skeleton and beetle, so it doesn't sort of in the chest cavity can spit fire each round. The skeleton and the beetles can make an attack on the same initiative. Uh, so it's basically going to have 2d20 because one of the attacks is the beetles. Any successful attack with the skeleton will also drain 1d2 points of strength. Once killed, the jade beetles disperse and find cracks and holes in the floor to escape. Uh, so what did I say? I think I just said 1d6 up to 30 foot. So I'll just put that into the... Uh, Next section and just get rid of that table, which is all messed up. It's funny, control X over a table often gets rid of it, whereas a delete won't. That's not liking that at all. It's gone now, <laughs> the, in, the unmovable table. So I'll just call it beetle fire rather than beetle ranged. And that is going to be, we'll give that a plus one and it's 1d6. So with four of them in there, that's four sets of claws and four sets of fire. And um, I'll just put to 30 foot on there, just 30 foot range. The fire can spit out to 30 foot. And I call it jade fire because they're jade beetles out of 30 foot. So that's it. Those are those beetles in that room and the jade bones done. But I just, as I've said, I've done the intro there. Bring it all onto the same page, just so I'm working. Went into the room parties, torches. If the table approaches, the four skeleton figures will rise and fight to defend the room, attempting to force the party back. And there they are, and there's their special as well under their block. And that's totally the wrong hits. I'm just going to say, I'm going to give them four. To escape and find another host. So room five, a large room featuring a range of old sacks, storage racks, and dusting. So again, need to make this more read aloud like so that it's broken up neatly as a, as a judge would read it. A large room featuring a range of sacks. Uh, on two of the five barrels in the room can be seen a set of verdant green weeds. On close inspection, they have small crystal-like drooping flowers. 
A wizard checking them can make a DT20 spell check and will be able to scry to a chamber beneath this floor. Can and determine that they are. I'm trying to think of a word distance, distance gems. I'm going to call them a different way. We're going to say call them ag aggle, aggle gems. If successful, chain release this floor in the oblex. You'll see a group of, large, a group of twenty large humanoids with various null, null-like beast heads sitting in a circle of prayer to a ball of light about the size of a troll head suspended. So there's one barrel containing old stale cheese, stale old cheese uh, that through through a thousand years. Of aging in perfect conditions has now magically imbrued and will allow the eater to gain a temporary. I haven't written that on there yet. And I'll just say two and 1d4. Hit points. There are six. Six wheels of cheese. Small wheels of cheese, I'll call them. Wheels of cheese with this ability. Healing property. I said to be concerned, <laughs> to be confirmed. So I've done that now. You eat that, you eat a piece of that cheese, and you get your hit points restored. If I can only spell that correctly. Thank you, Water Correct. There are six more wheels of cheese of this healing policy wrapped in red wax. I'm going to call it green wax. Otherwise, they'll call them baby bells. So now this is a key room now because this is where Idonia, the goddess, is resting in room three. And if I go back up to the map, just to sort of detail that, she needs the stat block sorted as well. Um, map here. So room three um, down this end, so the south of the building, is where she resides. And they will meet her and see this unusual visage of her having her... Um, First of all, they see an illusion, which is her dream, because she's a god having a dream, and it kind of visualizes it while she sleeps. Plus, they will um, be able to see her if they kind of see through the illusion. So she's got a big old stat block there. So let me get the let me get it out of that rubbishy stat block, so I can fit it into the better looking one. Take her kind of description text out of that. There's loads of it actually. Take that all out first. That's still not all of it. It continues on. Well, she is a god, so I was writing up quite a lot about her in the process. So uh, she is resting in that chamber, and let me get rid of this. So she can regenerate because she's a goddess. Um, she can fire a bolt of blue fire from her eyes, causing 2d4 damage to any target three times a day. I'm going to write that too. I'm going to say because she's a goddess. I'm going to say six times a day. Also, I need to increase her action die. I'm sure I only gave her one. 
yeah no I did say times two so let me get stat block and then we can start to see what she looks like when it's tidied up into a proper stat block and use that jade bones one need a drink Again, she was quite early in this process a couple of months ago, I think, when I was doing her. So, um, so her name is Idanea. She's a god. She has initiative plus four. She's pretty swift. AC 18, hard to hit. And alignment is neutral. It does 5d8 plus 4. And I gave her a move of 30, but I'm tempted to give her a move of 40, just so she moves very swiftly. So fortitude 2, reflex 3, will 4. Fortitude 2, reflex 3, will 4. And the only other thing I need from here is our attacks, which uh, if I just pull out of that block. What a mess this old stat block was. It's all gone sideways. Now let me read it out. It's going to be too much hassle. Well, 1d6, and she's got like a fist of a plus 5. That sounds fine. Plus five and it's one d six damage, and she doesn't have any beetle fire. So I think that's the lot from the block. So we delete that now and see clearly what's going on. Wow, I deleted that time. Thanks, Google Docs, for letting me delete a table. That's often what you like to try and refuse to do. So I've got 2d20 action dies for her. Um, move 30. Seem to have made that go to the middle. Don't know why. So... Let's get this room properly done with the read aloud block. So I've said here the room is currently a vision obscured. So let's bring that to the top because that's what she's got here. Stick that in. So italic to make it correct as I read aloud. Now I'll just see you as I read it back. So the room is currently a vision obscured by smoke-filled river, showing a cowled figure on a, pulled push, on a pole pushed small boat. This is an illusion and is eyed in air dreaming of her past life as a gatekeeper, so we don't want to say that. Get rid of that. Okay, so get rid of my echo on my voice as well. And bring this down here, get rid of the R uh, italic. So the room is currently vision obs obscured by smoke. Get rid of the of. Obscured by smoke. sluggish grey river, dark river, with a cowed figure on a pole pushed a small boat. And I'll just say, as the vision clears, Uh, 
horrific. Horrific. And unnerving. 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 And uh, seeing. on its side. As the vision clears, an unnerving scene of a large movie can be... As the vision clears, an unnerving scene of a large movie is resting, is visible on its side. Is just eyeballs on stalks with brain and vascular system. Laid out in human proportions. sleeping humanoid. So how does that read back? So the room is currently a vision on the school by, by smoke and showing a sluggish dark river with a cowed figure standing. As you enter the room, the vision fades to reveal a flag stone floor room with something laying. now at least anyway. As the vision clears, an unnerving scene of a large humanoid is visible on its side and is just eyeballs on stalks with brain and vascular system with a brain and vascular system laid out in human proportions stretching to an estimated size of a seven foot tall sleeping up. A beating heart can be seen in the chest because they don't know it's a female at the moment. And then I'll get rid of the that bit. So they now see I do it. So after a thousand years trapped in the oblique, she's beginning to fade her voice, believing she has died in this current state. She's weak. However, she is seeking followers because with enough people believing her, she will regain her strength and true form. I just I could actually I will just say the the vision was uh, her current dream as she drifts near death and clears when she is woken by the party I'll say. She's lost in prisons and currently Denaya is lost in the prison and currently sleep, laying on her side in the back of the chamber. And then this is her special, so this needs to come under the stat block that we were going to put in. And there it is. So I'll just put all this underneath her stat block because it's her kind of magic and stuff. The only other thing I need to do is at some point make up a, a real uh, deity for her or patron with everything that comes with that in the Dungeon Crawl Classics setting 
which would make her even more powerful if they maybe even like decide to pledge their uh, loyalty to her or seek her pa patronage. Patronage. When I'm also, uh, okay, so let's read what else and stuff. So special. Precognitive. So this was rolled out of the monster book. Uh, she is able to roll a d12 to confirm luck points at the start of a combat and use them to avoid danger or other incoming damage. By using one point to avoid all damage from a single source. And I'm going to say physical source rather than magical, so she can just avoid any blade easily. She regenerates 1d8 hit, point, hit points, uh, even on the round she's killed. She can use prestidigitation to make items like weapons, armor, and, and small halflings disappear. This is an illusion, and the target must make a DC 12 will save, or the item or halfling will vanish. This is an illusion, um, or oh, this will fade, I'm just saying. And I'm going to say that that's after 1d10 minutes. Twice a day. Six times actually have fire bolts of blue fire from her eyes, a bolt. Oh no, it is she looks like shoot. Lots of other things going on here. Bolts of blue fire uh, that will cause 2d4 damage to any target. When a monster or character reduced to zero hit points, she can use her ability past the pearly gates to snatch the spirit before they die. The spirit form of the dead target will join and follow her like a translucent, flobbing witch light. Bobbing, <laughs> throbbing, bobbing witch light. These spirits can be consumed with a howl and turned into additional bolts of blue fire and then spells. So there she is, that's Idenea. She's cleaned up a bit her stat block and um, she's a god, so I probably need to do a deity thing for her in the, and plan that out, maybe maybe not next week, but maybe in a couple of weeks time, plan that out. So plot options for her. Idenea may offer to be a patron or deity for one of the more of the players as part of entering a bargain to plea or plea for help. She can promise Richard from a past life, which is sort of lower down in a chamber. Or the temple. Due to her being close to final expiration, her powers are reducing. It is also having an impact on the nearby undead and magical wounds. They are disturbed by one of such great power within the region. So basically, I'd already detailed out how she'd be having an effect on some of the other undead further out as she slowly dies. And then I've just put a note, possible magic item near her or on her person. I haven't detailed that. Oh, I have. A chest beside, chest in a room beside the sleeping form. The chest is called the Yolt and is a semi-intelligent respond to commands from Idenea and alert her if it attempts to, if attempts to steal its contents are made. Its appearance is a very old one with brass handles, a simple pair of keyholes. When it starts to move, it uses clawed crow feet at each corner of the chest to move up to 30 foot per round. And then we had the mortifier a longsword, so I don't need to put that look and take that note out because I actually did do the magic items that are with her. The mortifier, five intelligence, lawful, plus one attack and damage, wants to defend against the incursion of chaos, baleful against wizard, it can summon minions to support the world at once per day during a combat. And I've said it's a, a cocky dictator, the mortifier is always wanting to advise on the best of the uh, capital M. the best tactical moves for any creatures it summons, it will impress. So I need to put a note in here of the kind of monsters it summons, so that's another piece of another task for me, which will require a stat block. So yeah, that's quite a nasty sword. I mean, anything else, I probably need to give it a downside, don't I? It's all quite positive, but it's quite, an, it's quite a, um, it will uh, impress and urge on the world to suggest a specific move for the summon monsters. Um, so I probably need to just colour that in a bit. And then some other outcomes for her. 
After initial encounter, she'll ask for help. She has been prevented from reaching the worship chamber on the next level down and can provide information how to reach the next level. The next level. She will offer the mortify sword as a gift to those who agree to aid her. With the passage of a thousand years of her fading life, she's forgotten what life lives below on the next level. She only knows the sense of repulsion she has when trying to access the lower levels, so there's something that's preventing her getting down there. And then on to room four, which is the one with the secret trap to get you down to the next floor. So that's practically that whole floor done. And I don't know, cleaned up, and let me look at the dungeon map again. Probably need to put this on a... Um, on an overlay so I can get it quickly. So yeah, so maybe I can zoom out actually so you can see that a bit better as well. 25%. There it is. So that's the first level. So we've had the entranceway here. We went into the crab infested uh, room with a statue that kind of sinks into the ground and uh, has some text which allows you, uh, grants you entranceway. Six, this was, I believe, the room with uh, this is the room with the skeletons, the jade bones, which have the fiery um, creatures in their chest. Uh, this was the sort of just a, a basic storeroom, there's little in there apart from some unusual plants that they could find out how to use. A couple of corridors, and two, this is where the undead dragon, unborn, um, uh, yeah, still egg, uh, stillborn egg of a dragon, which was meant to be a pet of Idenaia, but a thousand forgotten years have passed and it's just sat there in flames in its undead form. But if they crack that egg open, it'll try and bond itself with one of the characters. So um, I need to detail the stats out and what that bond will look like and what it will give them. I was thinking that it might try and seek a wizard or someone with some kind of magical ability to bond with. Um, and then Idenaia that we just detailed, she's in this room three here. And this room four is the route down to the next level. Um, and I have nearly done most of the next level. And what we can do next week is I'll tidy that up as well. I think what I'll do next week too is before I join, I'll have all the stat blocks cleaned up first so that uh, there's no need to uh, just be doing a lot of stat blocks. But it's good to go through them again and tidy them up as I work. So that's not too bad. So yes, uh, nearly done. Let me just... Um... You will cut off your legs your arms and your head back up to the top so what are we up to page wise what's the page count 73 pages that's not too bad for doing this live but actually a lot of it is the crap though um, a lot of it is these uh, stat blocks which have uh, stretched up my page count which i need to tidy them all out um yeah so getting there slowly. I'm glad I finished those barrows last week and then I've now started to tidy up the main dungeon. There's not I mean, there's not a great deal left to do. I, I mean I started a few a couple of weeks ago uh, doing the kind of proper intro in the Dungeon Crawl Classic style um, and then a bit about her waning power. I don't know, that god that we've just sat it up. And then this correctionist, which is a malfunctioning temple assistant, which is down on the layer below her. Um, which is the reason she's all her followers have forgotten her because he's no longer teaching them about the god that they should be worshipping and without that she's fading which is why she's just a vascular form and a brain and a heart beating in her chest now because she's nearly faded to nothing and I quite like that, the horror, horrific visage of you see a god but um, you know all it is is a bunch of veins and, uh, and eyes so it's going to look a bit scary too and maybe she'll reform, so I could probably put some detail on that. If, if she gets a few followers, like bits of her image will maybe start to reform her skin or something like that. And the barrows that went on from there. So, yeah, I think I've done enough editing this week. So um, I'm going to call it a day. I've done my hour and a half nearly. And, um, yeah, looking forward to bringing this together again next week. I've actually got, um, yeah, thanks, Justana, for hanging out. That's great of you. Um, next week I've got a new, um, uh, if I shoot down on my desk, but I've got like a graphics tablet and I was thinking of maybe, because I've been like cleaning up the document there and getting the stat blocks done, I need to clean the map up a bit more and I may actually use my tablet to draw some of the map in the dungeon because uh, the dungeon's very vanilla. If we look again at that, um, uh, that overall map of the any of the dungeons you can see that they don't have when I get there nearly there there 
So that's the barrow and it's very simple. What I want to do is just edit this because I've got these as um, images. I want to edit these and add in the details like there's some skulls in a pile there. There's some carpets on the floor here. Just some basic details. Um, and also I picked up an old book this last week, um, an old adventure book that's from the 1980s and it had on every page, whenever it detailed a room, it had a very tiny thumbnail of the dungeon. So when you were here, you'd see the thumbnail of where that room was, um, which is just like only a small thing, you know, about a couple of paragraphs deep that was an image of the dungeon. So it stopped you having to leap, leap back and um, check the map, you know, because we all do that. We page through a book and go, oh, I need to go back to page 10 where the map is. So I thought maybe I'd put some thumbnails uh, in here too. That's another one. No, I didn't draw those, and I'm glad you asked because I can show you where I got those. They're from this website called uh, One Page Dungeon. And if you go to this URL, if you pause the screen momentarily and go to that, uh, the weirdest named thing ever, isn't it? Waterbow at dot itch dot io, One Page Dungeon. And it randomly creates dungeons for you like this. You just um, you hit enter and it will disappear off and it will come back after a little while generating a new dungeon for you that's a vast one that's a, that's a bug for you look it's put a four and the twos upside down i wonder why that one. the whole thing's upside down okay so something's gone wrong with their code there <laughs> unless that's the name of it some sort of silly dungeon let's try again actually see if it puts the dungeon the right way around so i use this and i export it out to a ping file and then I edit it by adding extra bits and pieces on. So it does seem to have had a problem there. It's not, not rendered that correctly, has it? This looks like a big one as well. Oh, they're all gone upside down. I wonder why they've gone upside down. Never seen that before. Um, I wonder if I can reposition notes or let's see if what the toggling does down here. Rotate to fit R. Let's see if that makes any difference to it. I can see that they've done some extras with it. They've got some extra like little bits and pieces. I wonder if that's had a any. You know, it's rotated straight, but it's still upside down. I bet it won't do that if you try that website out. It's probably either I've caused a bug or something else is wrong there. Um, but yeah, it's good to have a look at that. Save it to your bookmarks. Thanks. Right, so uh, that's me done then. So thanks for listening in. Uh, this has been Robin Fitton doing a um, some Dungeon Crawl Classics dungeon writing, and I'm nearly getting there. What do I think I've got? Maybe five sessions more left to get this into a basic shape for playtesting, I think. And um, yeah, nearly done. So thanks for listening in, and goodbye. I'll stop streaming now. Bye.